So, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the cinema of the German Film Institute and Film Museum. I'm extremely happy to welcome you all to another session to our lecture and film series dedicated to Chantal Ackermann. Um, it's the last uh, lecture of this semester. We're going to have uh, a bit of a break, uh, accompanying the, the break of the university schedule. And we're going to be back in the end of April. So I'm very happy to see so many of you still today for um, tonight's event. Um, as you might have seen, we have new uh, programs with a whole new design here in the Film Institute and Film Museum, the FF. And here you will find our lecture on page 26. And there you will hear, see that not only tonight's uh, lecture is on, but also we're going to repeat the film on the 13th of um, February at six o'clock. So in case anybody wants to see the film again or wants to recommend to somebody else, um, we're going to repeat the film. And as always, the lecture is going to be available on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to check that out. Um, and our whole program for the series, like I said, we're going to restart in April um, to July with the second part of the series. You can see everything here and on our website. Um, I don't want to make this too long. As always, we're going to have the lecture, then a short break where you can still get some drinks upstairs. And then we screen Je tout il elle and we have a Q&A afterwards. So do stick around uh, if you want to ask questions about the lecture, about the film. And I hope that a lot of you will participate on that as well. Thank you very much. And now please welcome with me Vicente Rediger that will introduce our guest for tonight. Thank you. Good evening from my side. What have been considered the best of the very serious Hollywood ghost movies, Curse of the Cat People, 1944, The Uninvited, 1944, The Innocents, 1961, and Robert Wise's 1963 horror classic, The Haunting, to name a few, are also, by some uncanny coincidence, films with lesbian overtones. Those are the first lines, that's the first sentence of a now, or one of the first sentences um, uh, of a now classic essay entitled Female Spectator, Lesbian Spectre, The Haunting. Uh, it was first published, or the first version of it was published in the early 90s in a volume called Inside Outside, a classic or a groundbreaking anthology on uh, for queer theory and queer film studies, um, in which this was, uh, without doubt, the key essay. It is an essay, by the way, with which uh, Frankfurt film students, first year film students, are familiar, because it is part of our curriculum, um, Introduction to Film Theory, and um, uh, it's uh, one of those essays that uh, really changes the way uh, you look at films and particularly uh, induces you to completely reread uh, classic Hollywood films that you thought you already knew everything about. To offer the briefest resume, as the title suggests, what haunts these films and what haunts the characters in these films and the spectator is the specter of lesbian desire. This is also, of course, a key figure that inaugurates um, a uh, key figure of thought that inaugurates queer, queer theory as a field, which is no longer just about representation of gay and lesbian um, uh, desire, but is precisely about um, the non-representation and the, the questioning of established orders of representation through the workings of, uh, in this case, lesbian desire. That essay which obviously was written by Patricia White, our guest tonight, is one of those texts, academic texts, that uh, provides one of those rare moments in scholarly literature where lucidity prevails and things suddenly make sense from a completely different point of view. It is, as I already said, also a key moment, or marks a key moment in the emergence of what is now the burgeoning field of queer theory and queer film studies, a field in which Patricia White continues to be one of the most exciting and consistently challenging figures. 
Patricia White received her PhD in the History of Consciousness program, the famed History of Consciousness program at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and uh, graduated actually in the first class of film studies majors from Yale. Um, her first uh, monograph is the book Uninvited, Classical Hollywood Cinema and Lesbian Representability, which of course picks up on and develops um, the, the topics laid out in that uh, classic essay. She's also the co-author with her University of Penn colleague, colleague Patty White, uh, teaches at Swarthmore uh, near Philadelphia, um, the co-author of uh, the film studies textbook, The Film Experience, which approaches film studies not, uh, or film not as a question of form, but as a uh, matrix of experience. Uh, she edited and introduced a volume of essays by um, uh, film theorist and feminist scholar Teresa de Lauretis, Figures of Resistance, and has published her work in uh, a number of really important journals such as Screen, Camera Obscura, and Cinema Journal. Her most recent publication is Women's Cinema, World Cinema, Projecting Contemporary Feminisms, which was published by Duke University Press in 2015. One of the focal points in Patricia White's intellectual formation and in her work over the years has been Chantal Ackermann. To quote just one of those publications or of the many publications that she's dedicated to Chantal Ackermann, uh, I want to mention her 2008 essay, Lesbian Minor Cinema, which is published in screen, in which uh, Patricia White in a way, riffs on Deleuze's notion of minor literatures to trace and track the challenges to cinematic convention in Ackermann's work, while positioning Ackermann's films alongside those of other important lesbian filmmakers, in this case, uh, Sadie Benning. Tonight, we can expect Patty White to add another page to her rich and multi-layered work on Chantal Ackermann as she turns her sights and ours to a crucial early film in Ackermann's work, uh, Je tuis elle. Please welcome together with me Patricia White. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vincent, and the staff of the Film Museum, um, Laura, others here, uh, for the invitation to speak as part of this series. Um, and it's, it's really an honor to be here among the illustrious list of collaborators and scholars on Ackerman who have, um, who have been here. Um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to, I have a slightly different version of this, so I'm sorry, Laura. I, I gave, must have given you the wrong one. Um, I'll wing it. Um, so I... Um, I, I want to emphasize how important it is to see a whole series of her work um, because, uh, as I want to emphasize in my discussion of Je Tu Il El, um, the work taken as a whole reveals themes and formal choices that rather than coalescing to define a kind of complete oeuvre, provoke a constant reconsideration. Um, and this openness to the new and the now is all the more precious since Ackerman's death. Uh, I, the many rich and thoughtful publications and exhibitions, performances, screening series organized around Ackerman's work internationally the past few years um, really activate this kind of openness, generating new meanings and new correspondences across space and time. Um, one of the things that I uh, spent, uh, I did last year was um, to edit uh, the 100th issue of the feminist film journal Camera Obscura um, on Chantal Ackerman, and I've long been a, um, uh, an editor of this journal, part of the editorial collective. And um, to, it, so this will be out in March and um, available online if you have a university account, uh, you can get individual um, essays and maybe we'll send you some send you a box <laughs> um, from the press. Um, so the two themes that emerged from the project that will inform my talks today, the first is intimacy. Um, the generosity of the transnational community of collaborators, friends, scholars, and archivists um, was very moving to me as I, as I did this project, um, including people who've been here or might be coming, um, editor Claire Atherton, cinematographer Babette Mangolt, um, Ackerman's longtime partner, Sonia Vida Atherton, 
um, an old friend of hers from the 70s in New York, Jane Stein, and of course, um, wonderful scholars, um, Yvonne Margulies, um, Janet Bergstrom, uh, Maureen Torum, and Brenda Longfellow. So I guess you can see the table of contents. We have contributions from all of those. Um, so the second thing that really came out for me was time. Um, editing the collection brought uh, forward the connections between the then and the now of feminist film culture. And obviously Ackerman uses time as one of her primary formal um, devices. Um, Ackerman's premature death interrupts any account of this history in terms of pro progression and continuity, but still her work clearly speaks across time. And I'm interested in how contemporary queer theory can reorient approaches to Ackerman's work of the 1970s. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit sort of intertwining the history of Camera Obscura and um, Ackerman. Uh, the journal was founded in 1976. Uh, the editorial collective, and we still call ourselves a collective, um, decided to mark the 100th issue of the journal with a tribute to Ackerman as her work was so inspirational at the moment of the journal's origins. And I really think, again, that was a really transnational moment in feminist film culture. Like, we were all talking about Ackerman wasn't there, but um, in many ways, we're far away from that time. Today, the journal is uh, more expansive. It's subtitled Feminism, Media, and Culture, and we go way beyond film um, as the media that we direct, that we um, consider. Um, we used to be Feminism in Film, um, and we have, uh, the field is notably less Eurocentric than it was at that time, less invested in continental theoretical orthodoxies, our contributors engage with theory, very much so, post, but post-colonial theory, queer theory, cultural studies, media industry analysis, and world cinema. And yet, Ackerman's corpus and wide influence in the intervening decades remain an important measure of the broad scope that the field has, um, has encompassed. Ackerman's been a focus of questions of female authorship, Jewish diaspora, trauma and memory studies, lesbian representability, which I will speak about, formalism, intermediality, and slow cinema. And key assessments of her work, such as Elisa Lebo's reading of De Est, appeared in later issues of our journal. But it was, of course, Ackerman's attention to form, which is the rubric under which I speak today, that so suited her to Camera Obscura's founding project. The journal's first issue opened with the collectively written editorial Feminism and Film Critical Approaches. The editors, um, then they were Janet Bergstrom, Sandy Flitterman Lewis, Liz Lyons, and Constance Penley, introduced readers to what Penley would characterize elsewhere as the journal's, quote, distinctive and insistently polemical strain of feminist film criticism. Camera Obscura definitely had a reputation, um, <laughs> and it, we're still shaking it in some ways. Its focus was, quote, films made by women that offer a critique of the representation of woman in classical cinema. They contribute to the development of a feminist counter cinema, both by having as their central concern a feminist problematic and by operating specific challenges to cinematic codes and narrative conventions of illusionist cinema. So that first issue also included a column called Woman Working by Christina Kredling, who was worked with the collective as well. And it included annotated filmographies of a number of women active at the time, including um, Germany's Dora O oh and uh, Chantal Ackerman. Cameron Obscura was able to specialize in this way because of the variety and robustness of feminist film culture in the mid-1970s. The um, editors were, were um, escapees from a journal called Women in Film. Um, that journal, along with Frauland und Film and Jump Cut, encompassed many other dimensions of women's film culture, including activist documentary, um, contemporary industrial cinema, animation, you have it. But um, again, I'm sort of talking about how Camera Obscura had like a sort of curated perspective. That time also saw a host of grassroots organizations, um, festivals like Film de Femme in Crete, distributors, including Women Make Movies, with which I've been affiliated for many years um, in, in New York, Circles in the UK, Delphine Serigues, Centre Audiovisuel Simon de Beauvoir in France, and indeed, not just grassroots agencies, but government agencies like Canada's Studio D and the Australian Women's Film Fund all started in the early to mid-70s um, and supported this culture. 
However poignant Ackerman's um, portrayals of isolation and inwardness in her films, she was not working in a vacuum. This institutional context is an important historical background for the current and obviously shockingly belated or, or repeated conversation about gender equity in the entertainment industry. And I'm just going to make a plug for the current issue, issue number 99 of Camera Obscura, which is guest edited by Hester Baer and Angelica Fenner. And it's entitled Women's Film Authorship in Neoliberal Times, Revisiting Feminism in German Cinema. Um, and it's, it's a great issue. Um, it connects the important work of the pro quota regime movement now with feminist film activism in Germany in the 1970s. Um, and yeah, so I think it's an exciting moment of kind of thinking back um, in this context as well to the, to the 70s and in some ways what, how we've slipped back, um, but also how we can pick up a new, um, new parts of this conversation. So while Camera Obscura was politically dedicated to women's filmmaking, it was wittingly or not building a canon of experimental filmmakers, including Ackerman, Yvonne Rayner, Marguerite Duras, Sally Potter, later Trinti Minha. Uh, the journal's editors had studied in France and were interested in francophone filmmakers and debates around écriture féminine and spectatorship. The journal's second issue featured, I think, a, a touchstone interview with Ackermann after her work screened at the Pacific Film Archives, as well as a short critical essay on Jean Dillman, um, Ackermann's masterwork, still considered to be her, her most important film, um, which was written by Janet Bergstrom for the collective. So there was this kind of um, attempt to, to be, you know, this is the, this is the, the, the collective's opinion on Ackermann. The astonishing precision of the language of both artist and critic make these touchstone texts in feminist film studies. Ackerman answered, quote, I do think it is a feminist film because I give space to images that were never or almost never shown in that way, like the daily gestures of a woman, end quote. And Bergstrom argued, it is the quality and interest of the controlling look that makes Jean Dielman stand out formally as feminist and not any particular formal features. Um, so Jean Dielman, uh, made at age 25 with remarkable self-possession, was Ackerman's first film uh, made with government funding um, from the Belgian government. And obviously, it established her reputation. As most of you know, it follows a housewife and casual prostitute across three days of her routine as it unravels. Um, the critical success of the film, an homage to her aunt and to her mother, bourgeois Jewish housewives in post-war Belgium, um, occasioned the release of uh, Je Tue Elle, Elle, Ackerman's more modest debut feature in its wake. So um, Je Tue Elle was completed first, but released um, sort of right after um, Jean Dillman in, in, in France, at least, and it was so also in its shadow. Je Tue Elle, Elle, a tripartite tale of a young woman, played by Ackerman, is the switch point between Ackerman's New York films, shot by Babette Mangold, and the more narrative-driven Jean Dillman. And I had just a few uh, still images from the archive that Jane Stein um, shared with us for the issue. And these are some photos that people hadn't really seen um, of Ackerman's time in the early 70s in New York. I just have a couple. This one, um, this is Ackerman and her, um, her producer, longtime friend, Marilyn Watelet. And um, this is Jane Stein um, and Ackerman. And I just love the energy and uh, that look <laughs> that Ackerman is giving her. Um, so, Je Tue Ilo. In the first part of the film, um, the protagonist is isolated um, in a small room, agitated and immobile at the same time, obsessively writing a letter and eating sugar <laughs> from a bag. And you'll see this, and I, so I hope you have snacks. Um, so, I'm just going to start this because I might not start right away, and her clips are long. So. Um, Ackerman narrates the action in first person, um, though her voiceover remains out of sync uh, with what appears on screen, which is happening to me right now, too. Um, I think it'll come up, because um, we chested it. Okay. 
the line, it's very close to the beginning of the film, the first line is, and I left, and then she says the first day I painted all the furniture blue, the second day I painted it green. So the second part of the film, um, she hitches a ride with a, a truck driver, and this is, you can see it's, it's very grainy and dark. Um, Ackerman is just here in the side of the image. Um, eventually, they drive through the night, eat at diners, mostly in silence, eventually in a dark medium shot framed from the passenger seat, so it cuts a little bit closer so she's out of the frame. Um, the protagonist, and her name in the credit is Julie, um, the protagonist gives the driver an off-screen hand job. He then begins to confide in her in one of those characteristic Ackerman monologues that I think Ivani Margulies talked about, um, and talk, talking about his sex life with his wife and the women he picks up on the road. In the third section, she arrives at the apartment of an ex-girlfriend who welcomes her ambivalently. She continues, there's some fumbling with the zipper. Um, <laughs> and so we'll, we'll cut out there. Um, after Ackerman's character promises to leave in the morning, the two women make love. Um, as Judith Main points out in a wonderful reading of Jatu Illel, the film's structure is cyclical. The last line of Ackerman's voiceover is, she told me I would have to leave tomorrow. And the film's first line of narration is, et je suis partie, and I left. Um, so these gestures of arrival and departure are sort of undecidable. Um, this is the last shot of the film. I'm just going to let it play behind me. I'm not going to really talk about it. So we've had the sex scene in three shots, and I'll have much more to say about that without showing it. Um, let's see if I just hit that. There it goes. Yeah. Um, so, so we've heard, she told me I would have to leave tomorrow, and then she wakes up, and you're seeing the similar, like the eye contact that she makes with the viewer from the bed, or sort of makes, um, and this kind of real-time um, gestures of sort of departure and arrival. Um, the gestures of arrival and departure are undecidable. The door is left ajar at the end of scene one when she finally leaves the isolated room. I'm sorry, I'm giving away spoilers. <laughs> um, the, door, the door is left ajar at the end of scene one. It's very exciting. Um, and when Julie crosses the threshold to her lover's apartment, she stumbles comically. All three parts of the film use Ackerman's characteristic frontal, medium, long shot framing and durational style. With takes so long, they pass through boring to interesting again. Creveling had not yet seen Jean Dielman when she compiled the filmography for Camera Obscura 1. Um, and News From Home, Ackerman's feature after she returned to New York um, after Jean Dielman um, was still a work in progress. So Creveling focused um, her reading on Jatu Illel. Um, and I'm going to read. La belle que voilà les auraras, so that's the last sort of formal element of the film is this non-diegetic music that comes in at the end. And it's fittingly, it's a round, so it fits the like, cyclical structure of the film. Um, okay. So um, this is Creveling's, um, in the first issue of Camera Obscura, her description of the third part of Je Tue Lel. She comes into the apartment of a young woman friend, Elle, who seems to be or to have been her lover. They move around each other as if afraid to take a step or renew something. The light of the segment is very white. The camera is again stationary, but I think the shots vary more in their length. The two women talk and then make love. Elle is thin and blonde. Je is chubby and brunette. Their skin, the sheets, and the walls are white. Still, there are no close-ups. All the shots, or is it just one shot, are from a medium distance. The cumulative effect is neither pornographic nor lyrical." End quote. Um, so this is her, you know, kind of reporting back from the front. I've been to Paris and I've seen this film, and Ackerman is coming to the U.S. soon. So. Figure movement, shot duration, camera placement, and lighting are as important in this account as what might be seen as sensational content. Over three shots, the film traces a moving, if inscrutable, dance of bodies, thin and chubby, and the frame through which we apprehend them. 
The concerns of Ackerman's earlier structural films, notably La Chambre, which pans around a bedroom showing Ackerman in bed. And if I can get back to it, I had a, this is just a little bit from La Chambre. This is 360 degree pans, and she made this in 72 in New York. Um, so you see she's working this theme already. Okay. Um, um, yes, the concerns of her structural films are clearly in evidence. Ackerman calibrates structure and embodiment, that of on-screen fi figures and our own in the audience, with aching precision, a formalist phenomenology of gender that Jean Dielman has forever inscribed in the history of cinema, and that obviously I'm saying Jatou Hillel is very important to as well. Babette Mangold illuminates the relationship between these two films um, kind of in a production context in an interview with Janet Bergstrom in this new issue of Camera Obscura. When Ackerman returned to France, she met Delphine Sirig at a film festival and got her to agree to read her script. As Mangold recounts the story, she applied for money from Belgium, but she felt she would never get the money with the portfolio she had. She had to do a film very quickly, so in 1974, she made Je Il Elle in 35 millimeters, black and white, shot in four or five days. She shot everything MOS. Um, without sound, um, except the truck driver scene, which she shot in 16 millimeter in one night and blew up to 35 millimeter. The, my goal's really good with the technical details, so she hasn't been here yet, has she? So yeah, make sure she's, yeah, she, has, she knows what camera they were all shot in. Um, Chantal had the kind of smartness to say, I have the opportunity to get Delphine Serig. My God, I cannot miss it. I have to get the money from the Belgians. And to do that, she did Je Tue Illel, end quote. But how remarkable to make a film that ends with a 10 minute long lesbian encounter featuring the filmmaker herself in order to persuade Serig to work with her. And this is the last of the three shots. The film's sex scene remains one of the screen's most striking cinematic portrayals of lesbian desire and intimacy. And the history of its reception says much about critical orthodoxies, social attitudes, and what I've called lesbian representability, including um, Camera Obscura's rather heteronormative approach to um, Ackerman's oeuvre. Um, so I want to suggest that the scene is both ahead of its time and very much of its moment, and that this untimely timeliness is a key to the deep appreciation that I and many other lesbians I know feel for this scene. Recall Kreveling's description of the film um, as she, end, she ends on, the effect is neither pornographic nor lyrical. This is important, it's neither one of those things. The disclaimer of voyeurism is a refrain in the critical reception of Je Tue Illel, and one that I feel um, can downplay the strength and the singularity of the depiction. Kreveling's words inscribe the film within 1970s debates about the depiction of female sexuality on screen. So take prolific lesbian filmmaker Barbara Hammer as a useful point of reference. In the short montage film, Dyke Tactics, um, made the same year as Je Tue Illel. Okay, sorry. Um, so aren't you like nostalgic for Chantal Ackerman's silent sound mixes now? <laughs> that movie's only four minutes long, but we saw, we saw a good bit of it. Um, so it's made the same year, and the filmmaker makes love to other women on camera. But Heimer was making the film in the San Francisco Bay era, area, and the collectivity represented by the multiple, and of course, white, certain kind of uniform female bodies in the image, um, that collectivity is also the addressee of her films, which were made for women-only spaces. Hammer's work wasn't covered in the journal of Camera Obscura in the 1970s at all. It took until quite recently for, for um, us to publish on her Greg Eumann's um, recent account of the allure and rebuttal of essentialism in Hammer's work um, is, uh, I think, a kind of corrective and a revisiting, obviously, of this time. So, but of course it wasn't that lesbianism was taboo at the time. Ackerman's film was released into a European art cinema context in which lesbianism was either fetishized or made into a metaphor. It's a fixture of the art house, a tradition that runs from Igmar Bergman to Radley Metzger to blue is the warmest color. Um, but this film demanded something else from the viewer. In an interview with Angela Martin, um, and this is another, like, Chantal Ackerman takes all her films to England where these feminists have been awaiting it, and they, like, they sit down and talk to her about all of you know, the films to date. Um, in this interview, Ackerman discloses, it's hard for people to talk about it. They talk around the movie, referring to Je Tue Illel. 
Ackerman explains the boldness of the film. Quote, when I did it, my movies were hardly being shown at all, so I didn't have a relationship with the public. And there were just three of us, the camera woman, a friend who was helping, and me. So it was very easy to make, and I wasn't ashamed. But I would not dare do that again. I was completely unaware of how strong it would appear, end quote. Ackerman's direction and performance, I think, really bring a sort of sense of amour fou to the scene that's kind of frenzied. Um, and Ackerman continues, you know, it wasn't charming or nice looking. That was one point. Like it wasn't shown in a very aesthetic way, which for me makes it strong, end quote. Ackerman's reticence about the film is important to acknowledge, but I don't think it's only because she didn't want to be labeled a lesbian filmmaker. Um, she didn't withdraw Je Tu Illel from distribution as she did another um, film that she was unhappy with. Her insistence on the singularity of her point of view resonates with Monique Vitigue's um, work of the time, of sort of, she has an essay for a little later, um, called Point of View, Universal or Particular, in which she argues that um, the homosexual or minority writer needs to universalize their point of view um, through formal means. So the special issue of Camera Obscura I, edit on, I just edited falls short in accounting for sexuality, a key dimension of Ackerman's work. Um, and I was disappointed in that. The issue is understandably overshadowed by the figure of the mother and, of course, the fact of the filmmaker's death. But this gesture of departure, often a joyous, joy, I'm sorry, often a joyful one, is attached to lesbian desire and scattered across the oeuvre. In um, Ackerman's first short, she blows up her town. It's called Saute Ma Vie. Um, she took to the road with her best friend in J'ai faim, j'ai foi. Um, it's autobiographically informed, but she doesn't appear in it as she did in Sotma V. And the heroine of the 1993 film, Portrait of a Young Girl at the End of the 60s in, Bru in Brussels, resolves to run away from home, if only um, to end up releasing her girlfriend, um, who's the object of her affections. But there's a sense that, and that film's just underseen. It's a lovely um, hour-long film made for television. Um, but when she lets the... Um, filmmaker, the, the girlfriend go, um, she sort of walks into the frame, receding into the distance, and there's definitely this sense, I think Amy Talbin argues this, that she's, you know, here's her vocation as a filmmaker. She's just orchestrated, like, you know, what her girlfriend, friend's fate is going to be, and she's going off on her path. Um, so I wrote in Lesbian Minor Cinema of these films that the young actress, who, this is a quote from that that essay, the young actress who plays Michelle, the protagonist of Portrait of a Young Girl, bears a strong physical resemblance to the young Ackerman in stance and presence. The later film is thus a less fatalistic revision of Sotte Ma Vie, that first portrait of a young girl at the end of the 60s in Brussels, which Ackerman was in. But Portrait of a Young Girl with its lovesick lesbian protagonist is also a less sexually explicit, perhaps, revision of Je Tue Il Elle, made when Ackerman was in her early 20s. The filmmaker, um, as I've just quoted, remarked about casting herself in that film, when I did it, I didn't have a relation with the public. I wouldn't dare do it again. I was completely unaware of how strong it would appear, end quote. I argue Portrait of a Young Girl finds a way to do it again, but differently. The film's story of an almost unbearable schoolgirl crush hints at how strong lesbian representation, such as that found in Je Tu Illel, might follow from the gesture of directorial and adolescent self-definition made in that first film, Sotma Mavi. If this is sounding circular, it's the, I'm, I'm trying to say that these argument, these films really do kind of layer on each other and that the gestures that are started in one, even if they aren't um, fully achieved are taken up again, and I don't think that this is, is, is futility. I think it's a kind of creative opening. Um, so, just finishing the quote, um, in other words, this film shows how a young girl at the end of the 60s in Brussels came to make Chantal Ackerman's films and to establish through them a unique and renewable relation with a public itself still in the making. And I think that's what's happening still in these screenings, series, and events around her, um, her work. Um, that there is this kind of, and I will talk about it in terms of address. In his contribution to the posthumous film quarterly issue on Ackerman, it's like it's, it is really an industry, all of the stuff that's out there about her. And it's, 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 it's something about it is I, I don't like, but I also find it 
comforting, and I think many of the people who lost Chantal really are um, kind of enriching um, that community um, through this work. So in this contribution to the film Quarterly Issue, um, edited by B. Ruby Rich and Ivani Margulies, Mateus Araujo writes um, a piece called Chantal Ackerman, Between the Mother and the World. And he notes this oscillation between leaving and return in the director's work. Um, according to him, the mother is expelled in Sotma Ma Vie, where the filmmaker plays in a burlesque register at not being a housewife. And the mother is replaced in the third section of Jetu Ilel by a protective lover who puts up the protagonist after she's left her own house for the night. It's not how I would summarize that, but, it's, but, but I'll make my point in a moment. He then comments on a highly charged sequence in the film Les Rendezvous de Anna, which is right after Jean Dillman. And this is an amazing scene where the daughter, played by Aurore Clement, but clearly not a biographical stand-in, um, is sharing a double bed, herself naked, with her mother in a hotel, and telling her about a lesbian love affair that had evoked memories of her mother in her, end quote. So I'm suggesting that um, Araujo's sort of um, connecting the, um, the connecting this return to the mother through an encounter with the world that's mediated by lesbianism that he kind of doesn't then build up into saying to what extent maybe that um, world that she's making um, through lesbian desire is a kind of departure. Teresa de Laredes has argued that um, Jean Dielman is Quote, a film whose visual and symbolic space addresses its spectator as a woman, regardless of the gender of the viewer. Um, and uh, um, Elizabeth Lebovo Lebovici, um, contributing to an online uh, roundup of things by women um, on Ackerman, um, makes the question of lesbian address um, uh, in Jitu Il El. Um, the center of her really, I think, astute um, observation that I feel a little bit differently about, um, but I think is, is crucial. So Lebo Lebovici writes, quote, the two women shove their bodies against one another. They make love without fucking. There's a respectful distance, and it will always remain so. This flaring intimacy shown without voyeurism is also a way, this is at least the way I read it, to address all spectators, to avoid making of Chantal Ackerman my or our filmmaker, avoiding, therefore, to reduce her to being solely a lesbian filmmaker. In her refusal to identify Je tu il elle as a lesbian film, as elsewhere, Ackerman objected to the terms feminist or women's cinema. Ackerman somehow gives me a place back within the world. She does not exclude anybody. She includes me, end quote. I think that's a really beautiful formulation. Um, uh, but I think um, I would uh, connect this to how Mon Monique Fatigue talks about um, address. So... Um, this kind of idea of universalizing the minority perspective so that it's, because we can go endlessly around this question of Ackerman didn't want her films to be shown in this lesbian film festival. She didn't call them a feminist film. She said, these are my films. Um, but formally, structurally, I think they do inscribe that position not only as one of enunciation, and of course the authorship is happening in multiple levels of inscription in Jetu Illel. She's on screen, she's doing a voiceover, um, she's creating a set of of camera placements and camera movements that are going to become her signature. Um, and it's inscribed in, in the address to the audience. So as Bonveniste reminds us, je and tu are empty signifiers, except in the present instance of discourse. Um, and Vitigue actually argues that even those personal pronouns are um, overwritten with the mark of gender. And of course, if you do, even though je and tu in French would not necessarily be gendered once you start having adjectives or whatever, you start to kind of inscribe gender in language. Um, but obviously, il and l, also part of the title, um, do bear this mark. Um, um, so if we say that Ackerman's authorial inscription through voiceover and her distinctive controlling look as director mark the film's je, the place where the film's sounds and images converge is me. Um, it's intimate addressee. 
Um, and the third person pronouns, um, Elin L, we could take to refer to the film's male and female characters. And this is, of course, a literal reading of the film that most people do. And I think there's it, its simplicity is an invitation to think about what it would mean to kind of conjugate different ways of thinking about this play of pronouns. Um, but if we do take them to be il and el, um, we have to show that, we have to admit that they're um, assigned very different places in the film. Um, and then one of the most beautiful shots of the film is, um, I think, this one where she's watching the guy shave once they've arrived at a rest stop. Um, so this tenderness of her observation, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But that's an Ackerman sound mix for you. It's going to, you know, really blast the sound effects. Um, okay, so the tenderness of this observation. In fact, let's do it as a... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, the tenderness of this observation of masculine ritual, off-putting to some lesbian feminists who saw it at the time, and also apparently to some uh, male viewers who thought that she didn't... Um, yeah, that the portrait of masculinity you know, didn't, didn't, didn't like it. Um, um, I think reaches out across our to our own era and our own destabilizing of the meaning of gendered pronouns. Diegetically, L is the female ex-lover who compels Ackerman's character to behave in the way she does um, in the in the first section of the film. But L is also Ackerman herself on screen. By claiming the je on the soundtrack in the title, Ackerman opens up space between herself and that on-screen representation um, or performativity. So does Vitig's idea of universalizing a lesbian point of view operating linguistically in uh, pronouns and then in the title, je tu ilel, how does it apply to the images and sounds of the film's last scene, um, the scene with the, with the lover? Um, so let's see if I can get back in here. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to play this one. And this is sort of after she trips and falls and pretends like she's going to leave and finally gets that, you know, crackly raincoat <laughs> zipped up. Um, she decides she's hungry and she's fed by a slightly exasperated um, L. Oh, sorry. What did I do? I said, if there's any clip that I want to show, it's this one. So you're going to stay for it. <laughs> um. So a great deal of this final section is um, devoted to the women exchanging gazes, that is, before they go to the bedroom. Play. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's a still image. I mean, that is like the beauty of her work. So, yeah. Um, so, a great deal of the section of the film is devoted to the exchange of gazes between the young women, which relay our own gaze at the screen and Ackerman's behind the camera. Um, Spiraling back to the to like camera obscura's early commitments from this very different moment, and this is what I was thinking in the work that I was doing, we can see um, not only that the journal failed to see some of the importance of this lesbian universalized point of view in Ackerman's work, but we also, I think, feel what queer theorist Beth Freeman calls the temporal drag of queer history. It's there in the quirky joys of the film's minimal 70s mise-en-scene. This is one of my favorite shots in the history of cinema. I just love the pattern on the, ta on the tablecloth, the lover's granny dress, um, Ackerman, who's shed her childlike slicker, um, but is like ravenous for Nutella. And I think there was also just like a you know Euro envy of me, like wow, they they put a lot of butter on sandwiches in Europe, don't they? <laughs> um, and then the Nutella on top of that is great. Um, <laughs> now she's now she's thirsty. Um, sitting at the other end of this table, I take in this frank and forceful hunger. Julie's reach toward L 
is emphasized by overlapping editing, which I don't think you ever see in Ackerman. We see that gesture of pushing it twice, right? So she's really emphasizing this moment, this gesture of orientation, a kind of moving toward that Sarah Ahmed describes in her book, um, Queer Phenomenology, as kind of the stickiness of orientation, <laughs> of sexual orientation, where our desire, um, our identification, our movement through the world in um, a queer way sticks to other parts of our um, our lives. So um, she calls it. She talks about it as being sticky. So I think it sticks to Ackerman's filmmaking. This gesture reaches across time to us, the viewers, and it sticks. It's the end. So uh, I'm going to start off by repeating what we were just um, repeating out loud what we were just uh, whispering to each other. I said the sheer mastery of it. And I said 24. She's 24. She she makes this film in four days uh, to convince the actress of her desires, plus the Belgian, you know, film funding people. <laughs> that they should give her the money to make Sean Dielman. And there's not a wrong move in this film. The camera, so sure of the placement, yeah, so I mean, sure of the length of the of yeah. each shot, and the performance. She did say, and she says about this about, I think this film, but maybe a few others, that sometimes she would consider casting someone to play this sort of autobiographical figure, but it's really a figure. It's not like a character. Um, and that they wouldn't be clumsy enough. They wouldn't have her, you know, her same presence. Mm. And I think she, she said, don't I have a presence on screen? <laughs> and so those moments of just sort of, uh, there are contingent moments, like, is she going to look there? Yeah. <laughs> um, but they come so, they become so, I don't know, beautiful because of the control all around it. I mean, the, the, the combination of daring and self-assurance here in, in the director is just, uh, it's amazing. Um, written? How much was written before she started to do it? I don't know. I honestly didn't. So uh, how much was written before she started? Is there any um, written, whatever? Version of it. I do not know that. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the first sequence is so much a script um, but it's also there's a kind of improvisational feel to that as well um, and the layers of the sound on the image or is it the image on the sound um, make me wonder I mean I I'm imagine I mean I know that she has some intuitive ways of working like when she cuts you know when does it feel right um, but yeah I think there was a script there I mean the um the voiceover, I think, is very carefully composed. Uh, it's a literary text, and there there's some really interesting slippages into passé simple. I was going to say that the yeah. tenses, yeah, say the more, tenses, so, I don't know it as well as... Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it's mostly uh, passé composé, so that's spoken language, but then every once in a while she slips into passé simple, which is the... Um, the, the the which is only a written tense, the literary written tense, and it made me think of of her the the novel that she wrote, um, Une Famille à Bruxelles, which is sort of a monologue of her of a mother figure that is closely modeled on her mo mother, and then there are all these also these slippages where between je and elle, yes, right? exactly between and me and her, yeah. yes, and so I, I think. Uh, whether the voiceover was added later or written beforehand, it is a very carefully composed um, piece of, of writing. Um, but I mean, the credits don't say. Um, there's no there's no writing credit. Um, it's just I mean, she clearly authors the film, but but uh, yeah, and I don't know. I mean, we we could ask Eric de Kauper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> what, what his and Emil Popper's uh, role here was, yeah. because because uh, Emil later, uh, uh, Eric later became her 
uh, main screenwriter, dialogue partner, but the way Eric described it anyways when he was here discussing La Captive is that he his main function was to give structure to what he what he was doing anyway. <laughs> so he was basically just recording her moves. Um, and uh, it, it will be interesting to know if that kind of relationship uh, uh, went into that, into that film as well. Yes, Anya, please. I have one question. Um, in the first scene, this sugar becomes more and more really a metaphor or a symbol. Have you done some research or thought about that, what this sugar also means or the Puder, role of it's this. It's Zucker also. Yeah. It's not really Puderzucker. It's not what we is. German call Puderzucker. The, the, yeah, the, the, uh, no, it's, it's not. For, for like us <laughs> Germans, it's not Puderzucker. Uh, that's true. You're right. <laughs> but, but the role of the sugar, um, it's like a symbol or metaphor. Have you thought about that? Have you? Uh, well, I think there's the obvious orality that is there in the sexuality and also in the eating, but it's also a non-nutritious um, substance. I mean, it's compulsive. I love the sound. I've, I've often read that it's powdered sugar. Everyone says it's powdered sugar. It's like, no, it sounds like granulated sugar. There's this, and to me, that sound comes back when they're rolling around on the sheets and there's this kind of like, yeah, you know, yeah. this, this... Yeah, the, this, like almost the scratching sound. Yeah, the, the scratchy is. sound. But I do think it is the... And then, and also, I think um, Judith Main's reading of the coffee in... Um, Jean Dielman um, is sort of like there's this representation of time where she's pouring water just going through a you know coffee filter and to me the sugar that f falls and then kind of gets put back in there there's this spillage there's this excess but it's so there's a kind of containing of it but then it's also always spilling you had something to yes, say about also it also yeah. I was thinking uh, regarding the sugar um Sugar has this addictive quality and it's almost like I was looking at it and thinking of like kind of being infused with desire, mm -hmm. you know, and it's something that, you know, you have no control because there are certain the gestures of kind of consuming it was somehow, yeah. it, it, it went to this kind of weird entered banality and like mm -hmm. automatism, you know, mm -hmm. and I was thinking in that sense, maybe desire, because am I right to think I'm totally not um, confused that that film starts with saying that she said that I have to go back tomorrow, I have to leave I have tomorrow? I to tomorrow. It ends with that, and then the first line of the yeah, film is, and I Yeah, that's interesting. Also, this kind of circulation, I just wanted to... Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Please. It's just suis parti. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a spiral. Yeah. It sort of reprises. So also, it is very much that desire is, you know, defined yeah. by... Also, just like observations finger. about that beautiful scene of her um, in the beginning when she says, I painted the, um, you know, household blue or whatever. Like, just references to Hamashoi paintings. And again, that... Uh -huh. That sense, uh, there's a scene when she's at the back and then it just goes dark into the night. Again, this passage of time, mm -hmm. I slowly, it was just like remarkable. And I, and then she says later, and the, and night fell. Mm -hmm. But I felt like that was used in Jean Dillman. There's such a, a brilliant use of light um, going out to transition between scenes and it becomes this kind of compulsive thing with the... Um, Jean Dillman, Delphine Siri character is always turning off the lights and then it goes to black and then we can cut. But it worked so beautifully here and then almost like in without a cut, right? It, it just gets dark. Yeah. It stays in that darkness. Mm -hmm. And those are such beautiful shots of her in front of that mirror and kind of facing out or do, uh, window. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, to add to the, to the sugar discussion, um, uh, I mean the, the the moment when she spills the sugar and then sort of starts to shovel it back into the bag. That's just such a powerful scene, yeah. you know, the the, the waste and, and the trying to re recapture it. I was thinking as I was watching it that an alternative title for the film instead of Je Tu Il could be um, Eat Drink uh, Sex Sleep or Eat Drink <laughs> Sleep Sex um, because that's basically all they do. <laughs> And and I've never seen a drive. film in which yeah and drive yeah <laughs> I've never seen a film in which the protagonist eats and drinks so much uh, like, <laughs> like right and speak two, two so thir and speak so little and speak so little mm -hmm. um, and and the words the only sync words she speaks are je, you know uh, j'ai faim uh, encore yeah. j'ai soif <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's amazing I have um, yes 
Go ahead, Sonia. I'll, okay. I'll, yes, I'll yes, come yes. later with my little question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, actually, th there is a concept a concept you mentioned in your uh, talk, uh, which is this idea of intimacy without voyeurism. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to ask you to elaborate a little bit on that because uh, I find it intriguing, but I still am uh, asking myself, can there be a sort of uh, intimacy without voyeurism in audiovisual representation mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. Or what, what does, where, where is the borderline between these two? I, I I think that's a that's a good question. I think I was calling attention to how it was important for many critics to say this scene is not voyeuristic, it's something else. And I don't think that that is her concern so much. There's so many times in the film when Julie kind of looks, returns the gaze, and it's not a... It's not a like you're a voyeur <laughs> kind of returning of the gaze. It's a, a reciprocity. Um, so I think that they're really almost bound up with each other. The intimacy is only possible with that distance. Um, so I don't know that I would um, claim that there ever s that that there's a synchronized intimacy there's this moment of kind of belated address to uh, you having been there and having seen and it happens quite literally in the scene where she says somebody walked by um who was looking at me and so i got up and stood naked in the window so that other people could see me and then boom 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 but nobody walked by, <laughs> fewer and fewer people came. So I think there's a, a funny, um, there is a, there's a, there's a opening in the intimacy that maybe could be voyeurism, but is, is certainly temporal and spatial. And I don't know, in a way, I'm thinking of the tenses that you were commenting right. on, that there's this, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I'm not so ready to, deny voyeurism I think that there's the the idea of voyeurism as kind of like um, uh, like if it was composition in depth and there's this kind of idea of you being um, not uh, looked at uh, the, that the looker is effaced because of the illusion of depth and that and she definitely goes against that notion of voyeurism with the frontality that you can't be positioned as like a owner of the image in a sort of monocular perspective she does that really well but whether there isn't another kind of voyeurism i'm not sure she's inviting a look for sure i'm yeah if i'm a, I'm just jump in very quickly. I have two sound questions, two sound observations. Um, one concerns the, the, the skin tone, the sound, of the sound of the skin in the loft making scene, uh, which I think is very carefully orchestrated to be fairly rough. Uh, and uh, I think that relates to the question of wireism because it, it creates a, an interesting irritation because it's definitely not the sound of soft skin. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one thing. The other thing is, as I remember, there's one piece of diegetic music in the film. And that's the song that plays in the bar when they and go um, shake pa, pa, hands. kind of thing. Yeah. It's not just any piece of music. Oh, uh, later there's, yeah. The, uh, in the bar, what they're playing is Gato Barbieri's soundtrack of um, uh, Bertolucci last tango in Paris. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking that's a choice. <laughs> I don't even know what to make of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and then I mean as the relationship develops. Um, it's can it's an episode of Canon, the tel uh, American television show. Yeah, because it's just at the end you hear him say, "Well, we can't thank you enough, Canon." Yeah, but it definitely has a '70s TV uh, soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. T t the TV dinner scene, mm -hmm. but then as uh, you know, as, as I, you know, heard the, heard the Gato Barbieri thing, and then um, uh, watched again the, the the way the relationship plays out. It's interesting how you can draw an analogy 
uh, between the Brando character and the um, and the truck driver, mm-hmm. where he starts telling the story that she doesn't want to know about his family and all that. Um, so I was just wondering. I mean, I, I don't think it's accidental, but it's a flattening out of that story, though. I mean, I I think she does want to know it. I think she's. Okay. Sit- I mean, I all think right. she's sitting there in that that look of just, you know, tell me. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so in a way, you could say it's a rewriting of of Bertolucci's and. Yeah. I read somebody mentioned that he was Warholian, that character, mm-hmm. and I, I think I mentioned this to somebody, that that it reminded me of Warhol's blowjob, Absolutely. where you have yeah. no idea what's actually going on underneath the frame, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's performance, or, but there's a, such a strong sense of, of off-screen space, but it's already been established as this truck cab, which is so already mm-hmm. yeah. um, circumscribed uh, that you're, you know, I don't know, you're thinking about off screen, that there isn't much off screen space, but. Yes, please. Um, um, to come back to the sugar thing, um, perhaps it can be explained from the situation. She's spending many days, the character is spending many days in that room, and you have to eat something. So she starts out with a furnished room, but then she strips down the room to. To what's only necessary, she throw she throws out everything, which is decoration, and there's only the mattress, and um, in the same way the sugar can be explained. So it, I think she she's spending there 28 days, and the sugar is providing just the necessary energy without anything else, which um, <coughs> which is not necessary, and after that. First part is finished. After the je part is finished, she is moving into another story, into the ill story. And I, I believe um, that he is providing the food. I guess that he is fa- he is paying the bill in the diner. And in the last section, in the L section, um, food comes back. She says. Um, I'm hungry, she fame, she soif, and um, so the sugar bag can be explained by its function. So it provides her her the independence to um, explore herself for 28 days, to be productive, to produce her writing, and also to be lazy in the time between without um, having to work or. Um, she's working there, but um, without having to look for money. And after that is finished, she is moving into phase um, two, I guess. It's interesting because the fa- definitely there are breaks, and there are the, as you said, these sort of motif- motifs of nourishment that are um, very performative in all of them. Like the eating is is performative, and that it's not about like sustaining yourself really but the tripartite structure it's not like there's a transition to a kind of well i guess we could talk about whether the third scene is a climax but i but i'm very interested in how you said she moves to a next phase but then it doesn't have the quality of a phase of a rite of passage um i think ivani margulies writes beautifully about um the film's sort of structure in that way. So, yeah, just to thank you for your comment and thinking a little bit more about that structure. Mark, um, yeah, just a couple comments. Um, the sugar, um, for me, the sugar links all, also nicely with your stickiness um, because it just, I thought, oh, that spilled sugar. How's she going to get that sugar off those <laughs> off those papers? It's going to be Lick so it. sticky. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, it just for me it seemed like like writer's anxiety the whole first scene and so and you just an strip eating disorder away and female adolescence as this very yeah. kind of this space of like you know kind of altered consciousness of yeah like not this. yeah totally I just had two two um two other things one thing about voyeurism um, since you I, I was thinking already but since you brought up Warhol in relation to um, specifically the the truck driver um, scene. Um, uh, Douglas Crimp's, um, uh, to my mind, beautiful argument about blowjob and a kind of um, 
um, ethics. He says an ethics of non-voyeuristic looking, but whether it's non-voyeuristic is a different thing. But his argument there is about a kind of way of voyeurism that's not about having um, that's a in which the the kind of object of our gaze is not there for us completely. Um, whereas it seemed in in this film that the one moment where perhaps the object of the gaze is really there for us is that truck driver um, who really is being um, investigated while um, while getting jerked off. Um, so there, um, possibly, whereas in the others, I think I, 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 I like the way you talked about the other ways in which she um, complicates... Um, the the idea that that our voyeuristic looking at her naked body is is acclaiming her for us there are different ways in which she opens up her own subjectivity and in, in in that way but those were two thoughts and then the, the the last two quick ones is thoughts about the radio in the truck isn't it playing like american radio um and the um the sound in the sex scene where it's this kind of like close to a microphone yeah. breathy humming that's certainly not well doesn't sound like the kind of sex sounds yeah. it's a different kind of commentary if you have any thoughts about that um when you you mentioned the sort of scratchy sound of the of the sheets which are closely mic'd but that the hum is very to me and connected to the the song at the end um reminds me of of Ackerman well a lot of sound in her films is um not articulated in terms of like even when they're long monologues and you you know you understand all the words it's there kind of as a block of sound it's another um dimension of uh I don't want to say subjectivity, a sort of objectified personhood or something. So I feel like it is a very, to me, it's a very beautiful, intimate moment, the humming. Um, it might lead to the author whom I cited kind of saying that there's something protective and maternal going on, like a less um, uh, erotic version of the scene that we're seeing. And it isn't, it isn't, I, I don't know. So I'm just riffing on what I think's good. But I love the humming there, and it reminds me of Ackerman's voice in other um, movies, singing off key, or um, or ha having sound that's not signifying. And that seems to me really precious mm -hmm. in that moment. And maybe counter to this, this, the, the strength, like I'm using her word, it, I, yeah. She says, I didn't know how strong it would appear that there is this um, softness. Mm. Um, American radio. Ah. Uh, I was thinking, I mean, to, to motivate it realistic, in, in realist terms, you would get those kinds of, I mean, it's American uh, U.S. Army radio. And you will get those signals while driving around Europe in the 1970s, even like uh, 10 years ago. Now they seem to have vanished because it's gone, all gone digital. But, but uh, you know, if you grew up, ask Krembeck, if you grew up in, in uh, North Rhine Westfalen in the 1970s and 80s, you would listen to British um, uh, pop music on the British Army radio. And and so all across Europe, if a truck driver drives around, there's a, there's a good likelihood that you would that he would tune into an American um, radio program, which was specifically broadcast for American troops stationed in Europe. And but that she chooses to have that sound bite, of course, is another interesting comment, and yeah. it relates back to the American television program and sort of the presence of. American popular culture. It's in funny that, in yeah. a way. I mean, it's both a critique, but it's also sort of humorous. It's this kind of yeah. like, we're on, the, we're, this is my road movie. This is my, you know, American road yeah. trip. Yeah, and exactly. It's, it's both so Belgian and so, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, exactly. It, it's a genre, genre trope. Genre trope. Yeah. A cheap genre trope. Yeah. I mean, her sound mix in this film is just amazing. Incredible. Um, yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> he, um, I remember somebody listens to that American radio and then switches it, or seeks for another uh, station. Then there's a short sequence of another station that turns back to that American station. Yeah. Actually, you could probably, you, uh, we listen to American radio too here in Europe. But I'm not sure whether you'd get an American um, TV series on um, in a Belgium whatever restaurant. Yeah. I think this was mixed in by her, yeah. in purpose. I'm not sure it will. I mean, having, having lived in the Netherlands, I would have to say it's very likely that you get it. You get it with subtitles. Um, so the uh, at least Dutch television doesn't dub uh, American television programs. And, uh, you know, this is a small import market, and it's just too expensive to have everything dubbed into both French and Flemish. So you have two sets of subtitles. So I'm guess, I guess they're, they're reading subtitles. But it's also... Um I mean, it's just such a wonderful withholding of the reverse shot, you know, them watching this movie as we watch that movie. It's really lovely. I, again, think it could be just kind of a joke. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the TV dinner scene. No. Yeah, it's really good. Yes, please. One second, please. One second. We're recording, so we need to have the microphone. Yes. <laughs> um, I had the imagination when I saw the love scene um, of sculptures, of the sculpture of the kiss of Rodin, even that are not two women. But it was because of the black and white and the, this yeah. white skin. And then also with the sheets, of course, really like uh, sculptures very much. Yes, I think and so. I think Richard Brody calls it marmorial. <laughs> I'm like, uh, there's like a sort of, yeah, memory marmorial. Which kind of thing coming from this there. critic may be a distancing strategy, but I'm sorry, I, I and, could, and, couldn't and, hold back on that one. And I was wondering if it was um, choreography, mm -hmm. because it was really an amazing, you saw these hairs, and then always one face and just the other woman had just the hair and it was really, yeah. Yeah, I think very much composed, mm. but also that's, I guess, one of the things that I am amazed about in, in the film in terms of her sort of self-inscription or her performance um, is that she can direct that scene with from within it in a way that you think is so, you know, that's not a director, <laughs> like, tussling in that way, but I could think physically that, you know, she can um, turn her partner in that way or that they can, so that I just think that's a pretty cool way of thinking of film directing. <laughs> it, it also m made me think of uh, her Pinot Bausch film. Um, I mean, we're going to screen that when Beck Mongol comes here at the beginning of the summer term, but um, uh, Gent Scheinberg talked about it uh, two weeks ago. And what, what is really interesting about Chantal Ackermann's take on Pinot Bausch is what she focuses on as opposed, for instance, to Wim Wenders. Yes. Those, those, you know, sort of, sort of moments of conflict, desire, um, and and uh, you know, it has some some of that quality that scene. I'm but sure. but I like I like the idea of directing the scene from within it. That's a great great way of describing it. Yes, please. In terms of uh, communication and uh, the search of communication and to get in touch with another man or another person or with the world, whatever, uh, then then it's a kind of climax, the third, mm -hmm. the, the, the women's part. In, 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 in the first part, you have, uh, you have a searching and writing, but there is no one, no word uh, which she, she speaks. Right, in the second part, you have no word of her, not one. Uh, she's just looking and maybe doing something with the man, for the man, getting nothing back. And uh, the way of uh, 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 communication in the third part is such, an, uh, uh, was such a wonderful, distinctive uh, uh, play 
of the two bodies and they are talking so much. In, in no other scene of Chantal Ackermann I have seen, seen so much uh, movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so the movements are uh, miles away from uh, which you, you said, which she invented in her other film where, when they were dancing uh, in, the, in the bar. And, and even maybe Pina Bausch gets a little bit to it, but I think this is, uh, it's just um, einmalig. Uh, ne never done with, the only, with the any... Uh, uh, singular. Band. Yeah, singular. <laughs> with, with any dance piece, it's not comparable. They are dancing, composing and improvising so unbelievable that you, it's breathtaking. Thank you. Uh, maybe I add my interpretation as well, because for me, it's complete. For me personally, it's completely clear. These three um, uh, sequences. The first one is a woman at twenty-two. What are you doing with twenty-two? I know very well what I did at twenty-two. I search for a position for myself in life and this is exactly what she does this is a matter for the room she moves the things the furniture in the room she tries out the mattress against the wall against the window it's trying to position yourself as an artist in the world dodge that's the first sequence about the second sequence is Chantal Ackermann what she always did as a as a filmmaker and this is why I love her so much she um, she gives other people a platform to present themselves that's how she worked as a filmmaker she she gives a platform and the world is going by and and we as spectators can see through her how the world is going by that's the second sequence and the third sequence is she tries herself as a filmmaker getting using film as a media to get in contact with the world and for me this this so-called sex scene it's not at all a typical sex scene it's more kind of fight like laocom yeah it's uh, it ev doesn't even has this this usual climax with an orgasm and so on there's nothing building up it's it's kind of trying as a filmmaker getting and using film and getting in contact with the world or showing the contact with the world and she is trying herself out so for me it's programmatic how she finds herself defines herself how she uses film and so for me it's completely clear this three <laughs> secret sorry I had to edit. <laughs> Let, let's not forgive, forget that the film has an address. You know, this is made for an audience of one, uh, which is Delphine Serig, which is also unique in the history of cinema. Now, this yeah. is Babette saying this now. Yeah. I don't know how... I, yeah, I, okay. just, I was All loving right. that anecdote. <laughs> and I mean, and, and, and Babette yeah. being very impressed with like, I'm going to go make this film a film to prove myself, to prove my commercial, you know, <laughs> quality. I need this for my portfolio. That's Let's right. Let's do it quick. Yeah. All right. Just, just add one, one thought. I mean, I love the, the two interpretations that we, that we've just heard and they're really beautiful. I, I just would, um, would sort of not want to sell out the second section, um, so much. Like, I think there's, there's incredible tenderness that, that it's so cute how he like, you know, grabs her little belly mm -hmm. and how she smiles and, that last and, little. and how they sit together in, <laughs> we, we saw in Tutu Nui, like how, how couples are so happy just to sit in some, you know, tawdry Belgian bar together at the table and not talk. Um, I mean, she, she hugs him when they're outside, they walk arm in arm. Yeah. It ends with, with her, um, with him asking her or, or him, um, having her um, masturbate him, um, but um, but in the last one it began with the woman saying leave, and with then find okay you have to leave tomorrow. Um, I don't know. I guess I just would resist um, turning it into a, a developmental 
like necessarily developmental in which the second part is something we have to get through. Like I think, I feel like there's some kind of um, stickiness there too <laughs> that, 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 um, that's incredibly tender and loving and wonderfully non-moralistic and yeah. unexpected and uh, yeah, there's something yeah, okay. and it's circular. So of course that means yeah. that you, yeah, we that we're that. not. It's not developmental if we if we take that seriously. But it's not to take away it, um, yeah, from what no, was no. just said, but just to add perhaps some complexity. I think it's compliments it. and the the idea that she's giving the 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 person the platform or that the idea of these many times that she has the monologue and she, and it's a. So yeah, it's a set, it's a set piece, and then it also literally has a climax, kind of like kind of almost where you'd be at it mm. in a classic uh, denouement. <laughs> no, but but just just to un to 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 uh, underline what what you were saying, I mean, one of the most amazing shots in the film, of course, is the shaving scene, I love that. which is and then the pan incredible. to the urinal. And, and you talked about it, and yeah. you said that that there were some deeply ambiguous reactions to it. Can you elaborate well, on I that just, a little bit? I don't know exactly what they were, but yeah. I had heard, and I don't know that it was particularly that, but it was uh -huh. people um, objecting to the portrayal of masculinity, because it is, okay. it's a very, um, a very vulnerable um, masculinity. Yeah. And, um, and then sort of the like, why is there a man in the movie kind yeah. of, <laughs> or why does she have this, <laughs> this moment? So I think both of those kind of, pre, you know, prescriptive. Uh, um, yeah. So that's just an, more anecdotal. I don't know this, the, yeah. But the shaving scene, yeah. Um, to add to the story of love making or to the development of love making in the shift phase, there is no love making. There's only the development of desire for love making. In the ill phase, um, she says she, that she has desire to kiss him, but kissing never materializes. Instead, there is the blowjob. But this blowjob is this off-screen blowjob. Job. It's completely one-sided, and then. The surreal thing about it is that um, the recipient doesn't express emotion, but he is giving very um, exact technical instructions, and he is also giving very detailed and very good um, description of his experience. And um, it is right there is um, closeness between between both of them. But then after the thing, um, he gives also an account why um, further closeness is not possible. He describes his social situation and it's, it completely makes sense that he um, would not risk his marriage. He takes girls sometimes from the road and um, goes further than Blocher, but then um, it's only for the moment. And then we move to phase um, to the L phase, and um, you said that she didn't want her want to present herself as a feminist or a lesbian filmmaker. So I believe the the point is not that it is lesbian love making, but the point is that it is um, two sided love making. Of course, first there's resistance, there's seduction, but then when they are together, um, it's not one-sided anymore, and, but it's two-sided. And actually, a, a painting of Kobe comes to mind. There's a painting of Kobe of two, two women in very similar com composition. So we move through different phases in the development of, of, of um, intimacy. Annie. Yes. Um, she conquers um, rooms or spaces which, well, that's kind of amazing. Um, she, she goes into she 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 goes into that truck uh, with the truck driver, which in the seventies was kind of a bad thing to do for a girl. Actually, you would be your your parents would uh, would tell you more, don't. More likely the 70s than now. Yeah, don't go with the truck driver. Yeah, there'll be. <laughs> she did. She, she not only did she did what was forbidden to do in a truck, 
what parents wouldn't uh, wouldn't would, would tell her not to do. And then she, with that truck driver, entered um, what's that the the, the male cloakroom as a female. She was in there, and she even watched him pissing. And she she made us watching him, but which is conking a room where she would be not allowed to go to. And then she opened that door to her girlfriend, wondering whether she should enter enter that room, and opened another room. I mean, she she opened the dress of that girl and and kind of opened another room. So she conquered kind of she was yeah. And and I I love that in terms of just what a con uh, how much she controls the frame. You know, this is not a penetration of space in any of those examples. It's a kind of uh, flat space um, yeah just to f uh, just to follow on all these discussions I mean what strikes me is and to move it back towards the circularity and against the kind of teleological like this is the one two three but even though we get very little information about the relationship that she has with this woman I feel like we know a lot about that relationship uh, it seems like it's this you know, they had this passionate affair or something, but then the Chantal Ackerman character is just kind of selfish and needy and self-absorbed and doesn't, you know, doesn't think about the needs of her partner in any sense. And this partner is kind of like annoyed with her, but somehow still like exceeds to her demands. Um, and there's this kind of repetitive nature that, you know, she comes, you know, like she said, she comes over, they sleep together, says, this is the last time you have to leave, but this is going to happen again and again and again and again, and there's no end to that. And in that sense, I found the middle sequence is this kind of, um, it's a, it's what Deleuze would call a, a line of flight. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like this kind of, well, like break out of that, try to break out of that just repetitive cycle of kind of uh, attraction and repulsion and so on and so forth and 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 do something whatever it is and it turns out to be kind of a total i don't know doesn't really you know it doesn't really solve her problems in any sense but it's at least this attempt to break out of that out of that kind of death spiral or something i don't know um so there's something that there is something liberating about that middle sequence even even if it's very depressing also or whatever but there's something about it that's a bid for uh breaking out of the a trap, I guess. I agree. I think that there's also lines of flight in in the letter that then doesn't go, or in the cuts, of the three cuts in the whim, in this the sex scene or the encounter that mirror the three parts of the film. That there are many openings um, in the film for maybe are going to get reintegrated into this compulsiveness but that that gesture is endlessly intoxicating <laughs> uncle <laughs> give me another yeah. it's just one quick reaction to what you just said i just thought it was interesting that um in the middle sequence it's she is trapped in the sequence or in the repeating sequence of the truck driver because he's gonna just drop her and he's gonna get another girl and so it's not uh, it's perhaps a different uh, she's then the one part of his repetitive it, it's uh, a different carousel yeah exactly. but a, but a line of flight because she filmed it or she's you know taking it in as you said giving him the platform in this way that is is a is a grandiose no, I mean, uh, yeah, as against that, that observation, the, the, the bathroom shaving scene becomes even more powerful because I totally agree with what you were saying. She controls that room, you know. That's a very powerful move that she's making there. So, um, yeah. This seems to be a very, very productive object of a film. Uh, oh, I think that she just, by doing, you know, sort of, it's not... It, it's like setting rules, like the je tu il elle, and setting rules, and then how much you can generate from that. But maybe it's uh, not that she wants to uh, to rule the situation, or that this is the main impact. Maybe it's uh, uh, one moment um, where there are so many views, who's looking at who. So everybody is, uh, uh, there is a concentration of... Uh, of each view of the uh, of our our view 
the the view of we see her we see her when she's looking at him we see him we see him uh, uh, while he's maybe also uh, uh, seeing that she is in the mirror so it's a kind of a, a kind of liberate a, a kind of a, a free togetherness in just in the in the view in the way of uh, of showing the uh, well the power of a camera. And then the camera with a, moves, with a, with a, with a mirror which I think is yet another person. I mean, that's the female cinematographer also in there. That's yeah. the and and maybe uh, uh, or just one thing to the to to the to the sound. Um, we have uh, uh, in the beginning this fighting for uh, for words and for saying for telling what's about her, what she wants to say, and she's always uh, re rebuilding the letter. Uh, and um, uh, then you, we have uh, 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 this long sequence where she is uh, saying nothing. And uh, in the bed scene, there comes the sound of the sheets, and there is the sound before the speaking, which is a kind of singing, a kind of. So when the uh, when the sound comes to to hear for others. That's a step for, 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 for talking, for telling what's inside of you. Maybe it's a little sign for that. To try to get what's what you really want to say or what's all about of you. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. A second? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. What was astonishing in the beginning was the um, the imagery which was in between filming and photography. In the beginning you thought it was a still, but then you saw that she was moving. And um, this seems to be a nod to the film work of Warhol, when you think of empire, or also when you think of aquarium, you see these people walking in and out of the frame, kind of floating, but in case of Warhol, there is no narrative. Here, you have to, first you have to, she introduces you to adapt your way of looking at the film, um, like you would look at a Warhol film, or like you would look at, photography, but then she is introducing also a narrative, not um, not a conventional narrative, but a narrative which is fragmented and which leaves room for interpretation, I think. Excuse me. <laughs> I think that even happens in the camera movement, at, in that narration at the beginning where it's, you know, there's this like, now we're going to have this narrational, um, you know, uh, uh, formal technique which the camera is going to pan as she pushes this piece of heavy furniture out and it's just sort of you know kind of reduced to these very simple gestures of narrativity that are almost I think funny um, but also uh, yeah um, creative like they're creating a new way of thinking about uh, storytelling mm. there's an aquarium in the film by the way you remember it uh, when they're drinking beer mm -hmm. and that's of course also a very loaded image um, anyone else that we haven't heard from <laughs> 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 it is obviously you know um, Hubert Damisch uh, has this wonderful concept of the theoretical object mm -hmm. you know there's certain artworks that trigger interpretive efforts and trigger the, the imagination. This is definitely one of those. It's definitely a theoretical object and so much more, as you have shown us. And um, I think we can thank everyone for weighing in and contributing to this very lively debate. And thank, thank you so you much, much for coming. Yes.